Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. <laughs> Guys, welcome back to uh, Construct Your Life. This is Austin Linney here. We have a, a dynamite guest today, uh, Dylan Marma. Uh, if you don't know this kid, you need to because all the young investors look up to him. I, the way they talked about him before I even knew who he was, it was like almost like he was a messiah or something like that. <laughs> I just giving you a hard time. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing awesome, man. Glad to be on the show. Thank you, man. So, so Dylan is a syndicator. Uh, he works in the multifamily space. He was a killer salesman. Uh, back in the day in, 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 in that arena. And then uh, now he's gone off on his own. He's doing um, some multifamily deals, all kinds of stuff. So why don't you get us started about where you got started? You know, you're super young, so sure. you have so much to do. So where did you get started at? Yep. So for me, I didn't have a stereotypical path to getting into real estate much at all. I wanted to get into entrepreneurship. I set my eyes on that when I was around 19, so 25 now. And at that point, I knew very, very little, but I had been reading all the books. I really, really made a big life transformation at around 19, where I really opened my mind up to what's possible in the world of entrepreneurship. And through reading a lot of books, I got intrigued with real estate. And what better to do at that point than to go work for some kind of a real estate company where I could surround myself with people that would, would mentor me to ultimately get into this space. So... I picked up at 19 and left to go move to California from upstate New York. That was not strategic with real estate investing whatsoever. That was strategic with creating my life. Like you're talking, build your life, right? That was, that was what my whole idea there was. Let me create a lifestyle that I don't need a vacation from. Let me try to create this lifestyle by design. One of the big books that actually still sticks with me to this day is the James Altucher book called Choose Yourself where when I picked that book up, it was kind of the right book at the right time um, after you know just cre a, a bit of craziness in, in my life. And I went out there uh, to really recreate myself, to, to basically uh, take initiative and take control of my future the best I could. And started out in sales, like you mentioned, um, and I was working for a real estate group out there for a few years. And eventually, I still had the bug to go and sort of run my own business. And eventually I left to get into multifamily, uh, bought my first deal. Then I started partnering with uh, a group and continued to grow the business. Um, so over time or last three years now, it's just about three years full time in the space and worked on roughly 50 million in total projects. Most of you know, the, the bulk of that being syndicated deals that I, I was sponsoring, raising the equity from a group of investors and then done a few different direct investments, uh, seller financing deals, things like that. So, so for considering just a relatively short period of time, I've definitely have learned a lot, uh, worn a lot of the hats in the business, uh, acquisitions, asset management, working with the attorneys, working with the accountants, uh, working on some of the disposition stuff, uh, you name it, right. Uh, I've been, been pretty, busy and, and I like to be that way. And that's one of the things that I love about real estate is that there, there is so many hats you can wear and every single day looks different. So, um, and, and then just as of recently, uh, you know, the last, uh, last few months actually been, I, I actually right before this whole, this whole, uh, chaos with, with, uh, with COVID started to kick in and take place. Uh, I actually left, uh, with my foreign partners and, and I've been basically working on rebuilding a foundation to grow, a business again myself doing ultimately the same sort of things um, still multifamily still syndication but taking some time to really uh, collect my thoughts ideas and again build my future the way that I see fit no ton to unpack there I think what I would like to start with is you know living in New York flying across the country um, was a big move you know so you know, what were you thinking at the time or you just didn't know any better <laughs> and you're like, I'm going to figure this out because, you know, I, I interviewed Josh, you know, and I know y'all work there together and y'all were making really good money to pick up, you know, after a while y'all were making good money in sales to, 
to make a shift like that, it's hard to walk away from that type of capital that you're bringing in, but you had bigger plans for your life, right? Mm-hmm. Well, man, I, I think the leaving New York was more of a simple case. And if anyone's younger, I'm sure even people older are going through a similar thing where, where at some points, I think for me, it was a matter of breaking free of any previous way of me knowing life, like in terms, in terms, that sound overly dramatic. About no, no, it, no, it was, no, 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 no. I get it. It was, I get it. you know, it was leaving behind, uh, a lot of previous relationships, you know, keeping the good ones strong as, as I could remotely. But, but basically I had, you know, I had a ton of friends at that age, you know, a lot of them are not the best influences. And I decided, well, why don't I go pick up and surround myself with people that are on the same sort of a path where they're, they're investing into themselves, they're, they're growing something significantly, they're, they're spending their extra time investing and growing businesses, things like that. So, so for me, that was really valuable. I felt like I grew up really quickly in that, that short little time period. And then, yeah, as far as the income is concerned, one thing about myself that you know, I think has, I've, I've learned uh, two, two things. Number one, I always tend, tend to make the decision where I'm focused on growth over income. And I really believe in that, right? I'll, I'll take delayed gratification any day of the week. And I really believe that if you're focusing more on what you're going to learn and who you're going to become more than what you're going to make, I think that in the long run, the weird thing about it is that you're probably going to end up making more money, right? There's probably a certain degree, right? If you if you go and just be a complete, you know, say academic, uh, intellectual, you're, you know, and, and, and don't get out of the books and put some of it to work, then, then yeah, that you're going to get what you're going to get, right? You're going to, but but at, at a certain point, I think if you can find the right balance of how, what you're going to learn through the hands-on uh, tasks you're going to do and, and through jumping into new roles in a business and also what you're going to teach yourself through books and things like that, I, I always like to focus on that and try to let those be the guiding decisions. Um, but then the, the second point to that, that even though rationally and logically that is the case, one thing that I found to be true and would love to hear what everyone else thinks, but I, I really do believe that it's easy to easier said than done always, right? When, when you make those decisions where you are taking the step back, uh, you will feel it. It's a psychological thing. I think it goes back to our ancient ancestors, right? If you're, if you're out in, in the wild and you're going several days without food, you're going to, you're going to feel it. Right. And it's you, the same way we feel about the little, the, pay, the weekly paycheck, the dopamine kick. I got you. You ready? I'm going to slide into coaching mode for a second. I figured it out. I haven't figured it out. This is just my opinion. Sorry. Um, it's because that the reason that people feel that is two, twofold. One, um, they're in love with a result and not the journey. And then the second thing is, is that they, everybody attaches their identity to their job. When, when, truly, mm-hmm. you're, mm-hmm. when truly your identity is your core values and who you are as a person. Like the only thing mm-hmm. that I... When I wake up every morning, I have no expectations from any human being in my life or around me. That's what I'm working on, right? And so the only thing that I'm seeking is not a real estate deal, is not a friendship or anything, is for me to be the best version of myself. And that version of myself will permeate in every relationship, every business deal. And it's because something you have to understand, and I'm on my soapbox with this, what happened with the COVID thing is everybody thinks that hookers, drugs, gambling, and booze is the vices. It's not. It's work. And because people can't work the way they used to, they're having to look at themselves in the mirror because their identity is wrapped up in their job. Hmm. And because when you remove your, when you f- mess with your identity, it messes with your core of who you are because it's been interwoven with your job instead of who you are as a person. It's just a job. It's just a company. But what does your company do? Like does Dylan's company in 20 years, does it, you know, feed the homeless? Does it, you know, like how many housings, you know, like giving people housing is, is very important. Like I know everybody looks at multifamily from a, uh, an asset deal and it is an asset deal, but it's also providing a home where people, you know, raise their kids at. So mm-hmm. just my little rant, but that's just. No, I love it, man. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think there's, a lot to be said about that. So I think it's two things. Yeah, you have your identity wrapped up in your job and that couldn't be more true because no matter how hard you try to avoid it, you, your conscious mind is always forming a picture of who you are. And then when that changes rapidly, that's what puts you through 
anxiety or, or you know, uh, uncertainty, right? And, and I think that is what a lot of people are facing in these times when they're stuck at home with their families. Maybe that, you know, they're, they're saying there's all kinds of conflict coming up with, with uh, people that are at home. They're just not, not happy. And that, that could certainly be, I, I imagine that is where a lot of it stems from. And then two, I think also with the, uh, they say the, I don't remember where I got this from, but one of the biggest drugs is, is the weekly paycheck, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it's not about how much comes in, it's about the frequency, right? Because that little, that little kick consistently. Dopamine right, hit, to, yeah. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. And that, that's a hard thing that I, I've, uh, I, I know for anyone going from W2 to, to taking kind of the leap and going into entrepreneurship, especially in a slow moving business like multifamily, you have to brace yourself for that. Well, it's amazing. And that's, I think, a, a mutual friend of ours, Evan Holiday. That's why I am blown away by the patience to spend two, mm -hmm. three, four years on a project for, for, for validation of a, of a deal. And that truly takes a, a special art. But when you have a higher purpose or a higher why, what you and I seek, I know I might be older, but I, I feel like, you know, we're kind of kindred spirits a little bit in, in the fact that we're, you know, we're seeking a bigger mission. And we're always mm -hmm. going to be seeking a bigger mission It's because that's who we are. And, you know, even if you had 3,000 units that were sitting here today, you'd be spending all day today figuring out how you could get to 6,000. And it's not mm -hmm. like, you know, one of the greatest quotes, call it morbid, call it whatever the fuck you want. I don't care. People ask me all the time. I was in Costa Rica for three weeks, right? And they're like, I was looking at real estate to buy a hotel. And people mm -hmm. are like, what the, what the fuck are you doing? You're, you're on vacation. I said, no. This is my life. Like it's all in the same. Like real estate, work, it's all in the same. But my favorite quote <laughs> is that uh, my finish line's a coffin. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's like it doesn't matter because you know you had a job. Because I talked to this about you had a job that you were making great money, you know, and living in San Diego, which is a gorgeous city, and you're seeking more, and you're seeking, and you're and you continue to seek more. So when you leave that job. What's the road to get to your first deal? What, what happened? You know, there's a lot of talk I've heard from other people, not you personally, about the Grant Cardone meeting, um, you know, which I thought was significant. Um, but what mm -hmm. was the step from picking up everything again and moving across the country? Because you moved to Atlanta, right? Yeah, yeah. So I ended up moving out to Atlanta. Um, the Actually, yeah. So I met with uh, Cardone and I actually met with one other uh, mentors. So both these guys had established pretty large businesses. The guys over over 100 million in net worth at the time. And and uh, you know, I think in that, at that point in my life, I just was seeking some form of we'll say it's we call it external validation, but but really from from someone that had been there and done that, not just from my friends or family. Right. I was looking for like the people. I was looking for the people that have been through it to basically verify my thinking and say. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. You should go for it, right? So, so regardless, sometimes we just need that, right? And and yeah. for me, that helped give me the confidence I needed to take the step to take the leap and uh, move out to Atlanta. So I moved out there, and at the time, um, you know, I, I was uh, another mentor of mine out there, uh, Vinny Chopra. If you're familiar with him, he had uh, done a few deals out that way. I was I, and I was working with him, helping underwrite deals and all over the place, and. Um, so, you know, I was like, okay, well, let me go out there and start to build my own brand out there. So I, I began to grow a meetup, um, began to, we threw a live event. I was able to basically get a hundred people together for a paid live event. That was a lot of, you know, higher level speakers. I was just leveraging their experience to get people together. Um, and then my first deal came shortly after, right before that, actually, it was, uh, it was a little 21 unit up in uh, Troy, New York, well, going full circle. That was right next to where I went to college. Of course it uh, was. So, so, yeah, really funny stuff. But it was, uh, yeah, that was just a JV with a, with a couple of partners. We, we each just put, you know, uh, I think 25% each into the deal, funded it and uh, managed it. It was an old deal, 100 years old. Knock on wood, no issues. Uh, it's been over 10% yield since we got in. And so very happy, you know, about that deal. It's a very, very straightforward play. Um, you know, that that's a message I have for a lot of people when they're looking at their first deal. You don't, not not to go after a hundred year old deal, but but more so just don't feel like you have to go out there and take the take on some crazy, heavy, opportunistic value add deal on your first deal, right? Just do, just start with something that's a little bit, safer that you, you have a higher certainty of making it a win, right? Because that's going to, that's going to reflect upon 
the way you view the business and give you momentum you want moving forward. Well, in, in separate conversation, I think momentum is the number one thing in real estate that people don't talk about. I think is the most important factor, but you're nonchalantly saying, don't go after anything crazy, but you bought a 21 with your first deal, a 21 unit. Most people would say like, holy crap, you didn't start with a single family. So what was the reason that you said, no, I'm going straight to multi? Was it just economies of scale? Or? I, I, so, so yeah, let me backpedal on that. I actually did have a single family and I had a duplex okay. um, that, I, that I did by um, a little bit over a year before or so. But I almost look at the multifamily as it was really like my first one because those were more turnkey properties that I had remote team managing. And you know, that was just basic kind of turnkey single family stuff. So this was the first one that I really had more of a hands-on uh, process in terms of the takeover, the value add, due diligence, all that, right? So it's so much more hands-on. And um, yeah, I think 21 units was a nice number. Uh, a lot of people do say, oh, go bigger, it's safer, and this and that. But I, I don't always believe that. I mean, I, if, even looking at a lot of the smaller stuff I have, um, you have to have a good third-party manager. That's the most important thing because that, that is going to be a nightmare if you don't. So that that is why you want to be careful. But that being said, you know, they have, even through you know, COVID and, and any tough times, like they, they keep very high occupancy. If you get a nice, if you get in the right smaller deal, I think smaller deals um, overall can make, you know, they can be good yield. I think there's definitely a lot of good buys there. If you, if you're getting started to, to get your, get your foot in the door. And um, if you have the capital, I, I do like the fact that you're not really putting as much of other people's money on the risk, uh, at risk on your first deal, right? And kind of getting into it and getting your start and then learning through that. And then hopefully, you know, you're using your experience uh, to help other people, guide other people's investments if you start syndicating, right? So in a lot of guys' eyes, because I coach a lot of young kids that are trying to get in the business, you mm -hmm. know, a 21 unit seems like almost an impossible task when they're getting started. So mm -hmm. if you could give some advice, what was easier than you thought when you were walking into it? through the process and what was harder than you didn't even realize what, what tips can you give them on something like that? Because, you know, there's where you're playing in now, you know, 100, 500, like a lot of them aren't there yet, but like, what, what did you learn in that, in that 21 unit? Yeah, I would say it's really about just having processes and checklists, right? If you have number one on the, on the underwriting side, I would definitely, Get someone with experience to look over your underwriting. Doesn't mean you have to pay for coaching. It might mean you have a friend, you might have a mentor, whatever it is, right? But you definitely want to have someone with experience give you that same kind of, like I was talking about, like that validation from someone that's further down the road. I think that for me, at least, I think having a more credible source in the space, basically give me the thumbs up saying your underwriting looks solid. Um, feel free to go after it. like that, that will help big time, right? Versus you're not on an Island in this space. You don't have to take a guess at what repairs and maintenance are. This mm -hmm. isn't, this is not, there's nothing innovative about a multifamily acquisition reposition, right? It's been done uh, so many times over again, right? Thousands of times over again by sponsors all across the country there. So make sure you're, you're leveraging other people's experience and not trying to just go out there and wing it right um and, and learn through your mistakes like I, I think you you have people around there that you can lean on to uh to make sure you feel comfortable with that so that's number one with the underwriting that so you should now at that point feel more confident in your offer um hopefully you vetted your market thoroughly and feel good about that and then from there it's make sure you have a good due diligence checklist i mean really i boil down due diligence to where it's just a checklist so you take the thought out of it it's not like you have to be juggling a million things in your head. You just have to have a good plan and good checklist and, and be on top of it, right? Hold, I would say at least weekly meetings. If it's your first deal, maybe you want to do twice a week meetings just to make sure you're really keeping on top of it and really staying uh, with your nose down and, and paying attention to this checklist. If you're not raising money, it makes it a little bit easier because if you start syndicating, I promise you it makes it like twice as stressful during those 60 days before closing because <laughs> you're, you're managing other people's yeah. investments. You're dealing with the raise takes almost more effort than, than all the DD in the background. So, yeah. so if you're, if you're able to do it without that, it does allow you to pay much more attention to DD and then get through that. And, and, um, and then, yeah, for takeover, same thing. First 90 days, weekly calls with your manager, right? Maybe at some point you want to break those down to every other week or every month if things are really on a good cadence, but, but just be hands on, right. And, and just by, 
it's like anything else. Like if you, I always like to think like if you stare at like a puzzle for long enough, like at first it might just give you a headache, but like eventually you start noticing these little details and, and things start to, to kind of click more. Right. And, and it's the same thing. If you're on there and you're talking to the manager, you're, you're just going to start to see through a different lens. And that's how it's the best experience you can really get. It's perfect. And, you know, just to give the most value and I see, I saw your interview with Jamie Gruber, A to Z syndication. We don't have to go into that full on detail. Um, but, but if you could tell a new guy that maybe is thinking about syndicating, kind of walk them through the, the first kind of steps of syndicating and raising capital, you know, that kind of mm-hmm, parameters, mm-hmm. which is your specialty. And even I learn, you know, from, from, I won't be underwriting deals. It's not my strong suit. But you need to know the process at least if you're going to be the investor. So, right. Yep. So, what does that yep. look like? Yeah. No, that's a good question. Definitely, I would say this is something I get excited about and lean towards. Uh, and, and as far as like how that looks on the capital side, uh, really, you number one just need to build a lot of relationships. And you might ask, well, how do I build relationships? I think it's doing just what we're doing right now, right? We're having a conversation where we're opening ourselves up to the world. So if people want to get to know us, they, they have an option, they have a gateway to do so. I think creating some kind of a marketing channel, and I don't mean this from like a traditional marketing, like come invest with me, flashing signs all over the place. Like I'm just talking about a channel where you have an avenue where you're adding value to the world and that value is going to get reciprocated in one way or another. And eventually people are going to get to know you, you're going to get exposure and they will come, they will come to you. Right. I think there's, there's definitely an element of that where it's, it's hard to get around that. Right. Unless you have some crazy track record uh, working with a private equity group and you, you know, you're going to get access to institutional capital out the gates, which I know 99% of people don't have, um, you're going to probably go the route where you're working with um, friends and, and family. And, and then eventually, you know, you have investors. I, I, uh, don't mean this to, to discourage anyone, but I, I heard a saying once that I think it kind of stuck with me on your, on your first deal. They say there's the three F's that are going to invest with you. It's you, it's friends, family, and fools, <laughs> right? Because the, your friends and your family are the people that trust you and they might have that connection with you to where they trust in you and they believe in you. Right. And then the fools are the ones if they don't, if you're a complete stranger and they don't really know you that well, like, why are they investing with you if you don't have a track record, right? Yeah. I, and it's it, it's kind of true, right? I'm not saying that your first deal is going to be a bad deal. I'm just saying it's going to be hard to establish credibility with that, uh, you know. Um, so so just know that, right? And and realize that there's people in your network that you're offering something unique to that they don't already have access to. Uh, we we think that everyone has access to CrowdStreet and and Real Crowd and and the world of crowdfunding as it is because. We live in that space. You and I see sponsors popping up left and right, and we, you know, we get to we get I, to look at. Let me let me let me ask you questions before we continue on. Is it only me, or is it the people we hang out with? I feel like everybody in my life or everybody in my world does real estate, <laughs> or is it just because we're obsessed? <laughs> it does feel that way. No, it do, it, it does, and it feels like everyone that gets born is uh, now opening up a, a new. <laughs> shop so <laughs> which, <laughs> right. which is which is definitely not always it's not always comforting right because you because because but you also have to remind yourself i think you have to step out and be like well it's not everyone right it's just that we're so engaged and engulfed in it that it's not it you know our perception on how many people are getting in is no nowhere near like Oh, the outside I mean, world's perception, it's right? Nothing. Like, it's like it's like taking NASCAR and go. Everybody watches NASCAR. Well, no, they don't. But it just feels like that group really watches, right? And right, so right. I feel like like I asked this question at a meetup yesterday because I feel like every freaking wholesaler in the world lives in Arizona, and I'm like, how do y'all do <laughs> this many deals? And he's like, it's a big it's a big state, and you act like he goes. The truth is, this is the truth, Dylan. I think you know it too. There's only like two or three people really doing deals. Everybody says they're doing deals, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, fair enough, fair enough. So, um, so back to the syndicating part, the raising capital, and then where where are we going next? Yeah, so you're going out there, you're you're building relationships. Number one, uh, now when it comes time to take down a deal, you know, traditional, you're going to look at the deal the same. I would imagine for the most part, um, you typically you want to look at the deal by backing into what's in it for the investor, right? Don't stare at it in like a what's in it for me perspective because 
you're going to have to, for lack of better words, sell this to your investors, right? And you're going to have to present the opportunity and show them why this is a worthwhile place for them to park their cash. And the way you're going to do that is by knowing what your investors want. So I know market standard, and this was kind of speaking pre-COVID, I don't know what's where we're going to head into now, but you know, it was like a 15 IRR, right? It was underwriting to like a five-year timeline, three to five year or five to seven year timeline, underwriting down to a 15 IRR. Hopefully you have like a decent yield along the way. Some have less, some have more. Usually you have a preferred return in place, right? But you're basically, so, so what does that mean? That means that if you have an 80-20 split, maybe you have to find a deal that's going to do an 18 or a 19 IRR, right? Because after the investor net return, that, that they're going to get 15, right? So, because you're going to have your promote, which is the profit sharing part, right? So, so just thinking about that on the underwriting side, so you put the deal under contract, you go out there, you find the deal, then, uh, you know, just to go over it briefly, right? The, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to send out a deal announcement email where you're going to announce the deal to your investors, let them know, hey, we, we, we got one. I, I know we've been talking to you guys for months. Hopefully you've been sending out newsletters. You've been keeping them engaged. So they're not just wondering why is this guy, why is you know Bob the accountant sending me a real estate deal all of a sudden, right? Um, and then from there, you know, they're going to be excited. They're going to, they're going to opt in a lot of times with soft commitments just to show that they have initial interest and tell you how much they might invest all the other information lines up. And then over that period of time, it usually will take you about 30 days or so to get your legal documents intact. Uh, while you're getting your legal documents intact, you're going to be working with your syndication attorney. You're going to be doing your deal structuring. Um, I always, the, the one piece of advice that I could probably offer that will save a lot of people a lot of time and headaches is keep your minimum investment high. Do not go and like try to do a $10,000 minimum investment on your first deal just because you don't think anyone's going to invest more than that. It will be very, very, very difficult unless you're only raising $100,000. Keep your minimum investment at $50,000. I'm very adamant about that. Um, and then from there, um, you know, you're going to be going through, so you get your doc structured, you, get, you kind of come up with what your waterfall or your profit split's going to look like. You, you come up with what your minimum investment's going to be. You eventually have the documents ready. You're going to give your investors this 80 page document uh, called the PPM, which is going to basically give, tell them every single possible thing that could go wrong with the deal and, and scare them out of it. And if it doesn't scare them out of it and they sign a subscription agreement, then they're the right person to invest <laughs> and uh, you're protected. That's going to act as your insurance plan, making sure you've fully disclosed all the risks ahead of time. And then from there, they can go ahead and place their investment. And then you'll have another 30 days usually to close. Usually most deals are going to be a 60 day close. You have 30 day due diligence, 30 day financing. Then you close and then it's, uh, you know, it's off to the races. The work is just beginning there though. It's, it's um, you know, definitely a hands-on process with asset management, just like it is more work during the due diligence period when you're fundraising. It's more work when you're doing distributions. You have to calculate everyone's distribution. You have to Hopefully you're doing like monthly updates, like, uh, you know, keeping on top of it and sending monthly statements or, or updates on what's going on in the property and just kind of keeping a very, very good level of communication. I love it. That's gold. We're going to save that clip, send it sure. out to everybody. Cause that was perfect. Let's do it. What, what, what I want to, <laughs> what I want to spend the next part of the call, I, I try to give some value on real estate, but great. R learn real estate as you do. Sure. It, it is what it is on that part. What I'm intrigued with as I've met you in person and seen you speak and is, you know, for 25, you're extremely put together. Um, you might do something away from me where you're crazy. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But you seem like you're, you seem like even from 19, um, you have this amazing mindset or like you said, growth at all times. You know, what do you... What are you telling yourself every week? What are you saying to yourself? How did you cultivate such a put together? Because I, I, full disclosure, I was bartending at 23, drinking, gambling, you know, I, I mean, I was, you know, I would wanted to do stuff, but like, you know, I was kind of lost in college and stuff like that. So yep. how did you cultivate at 19? I mean, you were, you were crushing it. I mean, you were crushing mm -hmm. it in sales. So what do you equate that to? How did you get there? What, what advice could you give to everybody? Yeah. Well, the first thing I'd say is that I definitely wasn't always like this. I would say that for me, you know, going through high school, I, I was the guy that was a lot of times focused on throwing parties and just having a good time and always out there. Just you know, the, so my social life was, was my main and only life at that point. Right. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, I didn't play, senior year lacrosse because I didn't want to miss out on trips to the Jersey shore uh, with, with, you know, 
the, the rest of my class. And, and then, you know, going off to college, I, I joined a fraternity and, you know, it was just going out all the time and just, you know, really, really that was, that was a lot of how I spent my early years up until 19. Right. So, so I think to some degree, um, I, I don't say it's always, I would I would say moderation was hasn't been my my strong suit by nature in the sense of like I wasn't just like it wasn't always like very balanced like when I was going out and partying like I was I was I was doing probably too much and that's probably why I hit a turning point where I realized I got to turn things around and I'm going to really go all in on this whole personal growth thing I'm going to try to make something of myself I'm going to recreate myself I'm going to read obsessively um, you know, and, and when I was 19, I think I read, I went from not reading at all to reading, um, you know, I think it was like 40 books in the, that year. And I've been pretty consistent with just reading a ton since then. Right. So, so, you know, I, I think, I, I guess to answer the question, I'd say it, part of it is probably just by the way that I'm, I'm wired because when I get into something, I just get really into it. And I hope, I think I've just continuously focused on the right things. And, uh, you know, I, I'm constantly focusing on, like myself, even from like what we talked about the stuff before, like I, I've been big into reading, um, you know, we talk about like stoicism stuff, right? Like, like reading books where like I'm, I'm working on my mind just as much and like not falling victim to a lot of the, the mental traps and, and like the, I think a lot of us, especially at a young age, people can be very victim to the fear of missing out on other things around them. And, and it's hard to be so focused on your work and growing it. Whereas I don't really find that as much. I find for myself, I'm able to be pretty comfortable with, with, you know, who I am and what I'm working on. And, and that's, you know, I, I'm, I'm okay kind of sacrificing um, certain things on the short term. I don't even like to use this word sacrifice because it sounds like it's mm -hmm. like this big dreadful thing. It's not even like, you know, we live in, in the 21st century America, like where things are pretty good, right? We're not really sacrificing much, but, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm like totally good with like spending the time on reading and work on the business. And, and just, I, I think where I seek more than anything, like the people that I look up to and, and the things that I aspire to be are, are less driven around just money. And, uh, you know, well, well, I definitely have goals of, you know, getting wealthy and, and continuing to grow, but, but, um, you know, it's, it's mostly around, really just learning. Like I said, it's about like a focus on like who knows more than me, right? Who, who are the people like the, the mentors I listen to are not the guys that are, you know, on YouTube doing, you know, the, the, the two minute ads to, to sell you on how to make more money. Right. It's like, it's like the, the people that I'm seeing like that are able to speak at a high level on the macro economy on mm -hmm. real estate specific stuff. I've been doing a lot of research more recently and getting into like, some technology stuff, right? So I just, I'm just constantly studying and trying to like take in that. I guess that's what keeps me stimulated and that's what uh, keeps me fired up. And I got like three points I want to, but let, let's see if we can drill down on something. Was there, was there something that happened? Was there an event that happened or were you just tired of partying at 19 that shifted it? Like, what, is there something you can put your finger on it? Is it somebody that said something to you? You know what? Like a lot of people are looking for that that it to click yeah. and shift. Man, there was a couple of things. I think it was uh, number one, I was, I was going off. I was actually um, president of the fraternity at that point as, as like a sophomore. And I was like, you know, I, I didn't know where I was going to go next with that, with that whole side of things. And that was a lot of the life I had doing there. It's great. School wise, I was actually doing okay. Um, but then I, you know, I, I was out partying a lot. I, I think I had a breakup around that same time period. And then I had just, I just kind of remember waking up one day after I was evicted from my old house and I was in, I was basically like living in a closet with a mattress and I woke up this morning and, and, and that's where I picked up that James Altucher book that I mentioned to you before, choose yourself. And after not reading for several years, I did read a lot as a kid, but then I, I totally put it down for a long time, picked up that book and read that book. And I literally in that moment was like, I'm moving out to San Diego and I'm going to go, create something, right? I'm going to, I'm going to go figure this out. So that was, that was more of the click. There definitely was like a, a specific moment that, that I hit a, a rock bottom point with. Hey, you want to hear something? Uh, yeah. I, sl I slept in a closet for six months too. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I laid tile cause I was homeless. Mm -hmm. So wow. that is freaking wild. I'm glad I asked that question. Um, so you, so did you graduate college or no, you just, no, no, oh, you, so no. you just left. So you've done all this on your own. 
So it's funny, and, and you were talking about mentors and the people that you look up to. All the guys that I talk to, and these are players in the game, dudes that are doing 100 flips, 100 wholesales, $40 million, all this stuff, right? I can't tell you that we talk real estate maybe 3% of the time. Maybe. Yeah. And we right. talk about life, um, you know, how to be a good person. That's all we talk about. And like, it's even a joke where like, we'll get to the end of the conversation. He's like, do you want to talk about real estate? No, I'm good. <laughs> like, you know, right. what I learned in the last year and a half has helped me out. And I think you're headed in that direction too. I have become absolutely fascinated with uh, money markets and how money works mm -hmm. and realizing that real estate can be learned by doing, but the way that money's leveraged. And when you get in that space, that's a big game space and those big deals show up. And, you know, we get a lot of the deals from wholesalers or multifamilies. We actually get a lot of deals from lawyers or insurance guys, right? And so, you know, it's not always the standard go to, and I'm not saying don't go to a meetup, but, but understand that, that if everybody's, you know, one of my buddies, Nick, who's got, they've got like 600 units. I, I love him to death. He's, he's so great. I, you know who he is. He said, he was going to all these meetups and everybody said, don't buy in Austin. Don't buy in LA. Don't buy in Austin. Don't buy in LA. They bought five deals in Austin and LA. <laughs> great deals. And he's like, because everybody's not looking I'm the only one, yeah. one of the only ones looking. So, you know, my philosophy in life is if everybody's going that way, I'm going the other way. And that's just the way I roll. And it's, it's, it's got me where I'm going. Um, but what you're talking about is, you know, I can only imagine <laughs> you're a good looking kid, you're president of the fraternity as a sophomore and you're, and then you wake up one day and you're in a closet and, you know, I mean, you know, what would be really great. Have you ever spoke to that author? I haven't, man. I would. You know, it would be to. amazing if you wrote him a letter, dude. How great! Yeah, that, that would make. No, it I totally great. should. Yeah, yeah. He's got a great podcast as well. So yeah, I, de I definitely, I definitely try to keep uh, keep listening to his stuff. He's always pushing me to think outside the box and kind of question the norm. So so yeah, it'd be a great idea to 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 bring him up to speed. So on let's the story. So let's talk about the future. You're 25. You've done a ton of deals. You're very respected in the space. Um, you know, you know, what does that look like? Let's just say the next five years, what do you want? You're betting on yourself. Um, there's no better feeling. It doesn't even matter if you're broke as shit. There's no better feeling to know that you're, you hold the faith of what you want. So if you mm -hmm. had to manifest it in like, I think personally, meeting you. I think real estate's just the start. I think you have other interests as well. Um, that'll, you know, be greater than real estate personally, um, for it's just a vehicle. So, you know, in your, in your heart, when you're sitting in your apartment and you're meditating or whatever you're doing, what are you, what are you thinking about? What do you want to do? What does that look like? Well, I can say one thing I had a complete paradigm shift with is, just the way that I look at the future in terms of setting goals. One book I read recently outside of real estate, which I think everyone in real estate and outside of real estate, whether you're an employee or an entrepreneur, you should, you should definitely uh, check out is Lean Startup. Lean Startup is a book that's primarily written for tech startups. Um, and I've, and I actually, I've been looking into some real estate technology ideas and actually launching something in a little M MVP in you know the next should be the next couple months here um which is going to be uh it's basically a investment management uh portal type thing it's, it's gonna be a software mm -hmm. piece that i'm working with a partner on to to put out there um and um but regardless of the point i, I you know when it comes to the lean startup book one of the things that they they mention there is just you know, the idea of when you're creating something new you really can't try to predict you know, we, a lot of us have this model in our heads of like goal setting. We've had it drilled into our head. Like you have to have 20 year goals and five year goals. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, you have to be adamant about this and make sure every action you do lines up with this. And, and I think you can put yourself in a box and you can pigeonhole yourself into one vehicle or just going after a goal, just because you said you're going to go after that goal. And I think in reality, you're going to probably contradict yourself several times over. You're, you're probably going to go against what you said. You're probably going to do things differently every few years. And you really just need to like, like for me, I've just learned to basically approach this, this time around 
completely different than I did a few years ago where I would have had very, very clear set goals and I'd be voicing them out. But I, I, I'm, I'm more so just, just keeping my head on a swivel, um, seeing, you know, this environment's kind of crazy. We don't really know what's going to come out of mm-hmm. it, but I still think there's good deals out there. Um, you know, and I'm still, still out there looking, still out there planning to grow something, but I am really um, being open-minded right now towards the, the markets, the deals, and just trying to take a 360 degree approach mm-hmm. to everything right now. Um, so, so for myself, as far as like what I see, I definitely, definitely going to be in real estate for the long run. Um, I couldn't see this going away. I just think it's, you know, I, I have, uh, I have the knowledge, the skill set. It's a great vehicle. Um, it's a great vehicle for people to invest into passively as well. And then I think um, outside of that, I, I am really interested in, in continuing to explore and, and grow in something technology related uh, with, with real estate. I just think there's a lot of avenues to improve the way that we all operate in the real estate space uh, using technology. And I think that coming at it from more of the operator point of view and then over time planning to teach myself a lot, you know, I've been working on teaching myself a lot of that space um, so that I can, I can have enough of a technical background to, um, you know, combine the two of them. Um, I would say as of right now that that's what ultimately gets me excited. And, and that's where that's the direction I want to go. So I, I don't really have it all figured out yet, but taking steps in that direction. Thousand percent. And I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a gift because I jump on the soapbox anytime I can. Something I picked up like eight months ago and I truly believe it. And I don't give a shit what people think. Uh, I think everybody's goals are bullshit. And I think it's, I think they're goals for somebody else. And my favorite thing to do, especially in the multifamily space is everybody says, well, I'm gonna get a thousand units. Yeah, that's a great goal, but is it a good fucking deal? And then the second thing is how much of those thousand units do you actually own? So Mm -hmm. What, what I've decided to do is everybody wants to post it on Instagram. They want to talk about what they're doing and all this shit. It doesn't matter. Like, do you live a life of intention? So my intention is I'm going to impact others. I'm going to feel great doing it health-wise. And I'm going to leave a legacy. So if that's your goal, then it really doesn't matter how many properties I buy, right? As long as the people that I do business with um, and the people that work for me, you know, live in those goals, right? And, totally. And- and one of the great, one of the greatest things I ever heard, I, I'm obsessed with Kyle Cece. He's funny as shit and he's personal development and all this stuff. He said that what changed for him was he went on a juice cleanse for three days and um, he gained weight and he threw the scale oh. across the bathroom and he's like, what the fuck, man? I haven't eaten shit. And he said, wait, hold on. My intention was to feel good. Do I feel good? Okay, then that's great. And so, <laughs> so what basically what I'm saying is, is like, same like you're saying, I love how you're so open to say, I don't know. I don't know. And the thing what people don't understand is when you, when you make these arbitrary, ridiculous goals from external forces or other people, when you don't meet them or something happens, you're breaking a promise within yourself. And that hurts worse than anything else. And that will truly mm-hmm. get you down. And the thing is, is like, I just finished, uh, I've read like 19 books during this quarantine. I'm, I can't help it, <laughs> but I read At- atomic habits and that's my new, that's, a good one. that's yep. my new thing with young real estate investors. Get a win, get a win, get small. It doesn't matter mm-hmm. how small a thousand bucks, who cares, but stack that thousand 10 times over. And then you got 10,000. How good do you feel about yourself? And when you feel totally. great about yourself, you're open to the abundance of more deals coming in. Like, you know what I'm saying? Totally. Totally. It, it, and it's so much driven by uh, feedback. I, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of our outlooks on anything is reinforced by the feedback that we've received in our own lives. Right. So if you're able to get those small wins or perceive things as small wins, then your, your outlook is going to be changed completely and you're going to be, more responsive to continue to, to do it and, and to, uh, to grow again. So yeah, man, that, that to me is, is, uh, I'm, I'm totally with you on that. I think becoming more routine driven than goal driven is, is the end goal, Mm -hmm. right? If you can, uh, if you can judge your, a lot of your, your happiness off just, just being your best self during the the day and, and feeling really good about living one day that you're, you know, and, and judging yeah. on things you, you can control. I think you're just going to be better off and, and you'll probably pay more attention to that day and the things going on inside of it versus just 
staying like like you said kind of, it almost is like a place from, from a place of ego a lot of times with just like setting goals a thousand and, percent and, and, it's, and there's a lot of like uh, yeah if you if you talk to all the big dogs and you've talked to them they got to a point where the machine was ridiculous meaning the team got big the whatever and a lot of them fired the team and retold the business because they're like this is not sustainable but it was fun you know like i had the bmws i had the crap but then yeah. you look at something what's happened right now like I, I i just say from firsthand knowledge like i spent the last five years in airbnb space it's my shit people are getting fucked up right now and i mean bought on leverage bought on what well, we're always going to cash flow and their <laughs> lives are going to be annihilated right and so you know so you don't know right but if mm-hmm. you if you if you if you buy right you you care about your employees you know you you do good things like that stuff in the end i have to believe will win out don't mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. no totally man and the, the, yeah it's not worth uh well you, you never know right you, you never you can't even say that they didn't in some cases with, with what's going on now, right. It's like, they uh, might've thought they did. were buying, right. Right. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, no, I agree. And I think, I think, yeah, if you're, if you're more focused on how to respond to this, to this given situation, when you get something thrown at you mm-hmm. versus being upset that you're behind your expectation. Right? Sure. No, a thousand percent. I just want you to know, so it's documented. I am looking forward to watching you crush it and continue to grow your business. Know that you always have a supporter in me. Um, you know, I, I want to see you succeed, uh, but what you will, because you're, you're so driven and, uh, just really like how you do business. And I just really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Appreciate it, man. Well, yeah, I'm happy to jump on anytime. And, and if anyone has questions, uh, happy to answer any additional questions. If any, any of your listeners, uh, want to reach out, you can reach me at Dylan Marma at gmail.com. Um, and well, yeah, man, no, it's it a great show and, and look forward to continuing to, uh, to watch each other grow. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on, man. Thanks, Austin. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.